I was born in the Midwest. I was born in Chicago in St. Anthony's Hospital in 1927. I couldn't speak English until I went to a kindergarten. My father was a well-to-do uh, uh, real estate guy who had emigrated from Greece when he was 10 years old to work on the railroad. There's a photograph of him sitting in his own office on the south side with uh, 15 or 16 of these telephones on his desk. I always wondered how he could tell which one was ringing. And, uh, but that way, and he was very proud of that thing. But two years later, the crash occurred, and everything that he owned, uh, every uh, successful or aspect of his success, just disappeared. And then uh, my mother had been hankering to come back to the East because that's where her parents were. And we all packed up, and one day I uh, just drove to uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. I finished high school, and uh, I was uh, uh, an aspiring artist, and I had uh, the great good fortune of uh, having an art teacher, Joseph Louis Charles Santoro, uh, a prominent uh, uh, watercolor painter in Boston who uh, took an interest in me and uh, encouraged me to consider uh, being an artist. I took the entrance examinations for Boston University and Harvard because that's what my father wanted me to be was a lawyer or a doctor. <laughs> and uh, so I put art third on the list. I was uh, eligible for the draft during the war. This was 1945. And uh, rather than allow myself to be uh, drafted into the Army, I enlisted in the Navy. And on the day that I arrived at Great Lakes or <laughs> boot camp, the war ended and everybody left us there. By the time I got out of the service, I realized that uh, uh, going to Harvard or to BU, uh, that would be just putting off what was an inevitable career, because I wanted to be uh, involved in the arts. So uh, I applied to Rhode Island School of Design. But by that time, the, uh, or the classes had been filled with returning veterans. This was in 1946 now. And uh, so I uh, spent a year at Mass College of Art. I waited for a turn to come back here uh, the following year at Rhode Island School of Design. I came here and studied illustration and painting and uh, graduated, and then I got recalled. So uh, career-wise, that was put off for another three and a half years or so. And then when I came back, I set up shop as a commercial illustrator in Boston. After about two years of freelancing in uh, Boston as an illustrator, I packed up my gear and uh, went to New York City and uh, began uh, making illustrations for advertising and uh, uh, associated publications. And in 1962, uh, I had been invited to come and substitute for one of the teachers here that was going to Europe for a year. And uh, we arrived here in Providence with two uh, children, little kids, and uh, began a year stay at the Rhode Island School of Design. By that time, living outside of New York City was not uh, a detriment to uh, involvement with uh, illustration and, or even painting. Besides that, the school itself had a, a certain élan or certain prestige so that uh, living this far away from the Mecca was not, no handicap at all. Forty-five years later, <laughs> I'm still associated with the school. When I first started working uh, as a teacher, I, I had no uh, intention of being a teacher. I hadn't prepared myself to be a teacher. I hadn't taken theoretical courses in uh, instruction or anything of that sort. I thought I, all, I, all you needed to do was just show anybody how to hold a brush and what to, uh, how to uh, spread the paint. And I came to realize that there was a lot more to it than that, that it uh, involved the intellect. And uh, that was when, uh, when I began to uh, uh, analyze uh, what, what the proposition was about in order to be able to uh, teach it to uh, students in an authoritative way. And so that having to articulate those ideas uh, brought me up against how, how does a thing happen? What, what goes on in the artist's mind? I finally got to the point where I uh, worked and worked and worked until I could paint a painting that didn't have a 
quaint house in it or a charming little boat or anything of that sort, but it was merely a color, shape, and the juxtaposition of those things. And then I came to realize that that was what painting was about. That the subject matter was the relationships of the shapes that existed within the context of uh, the uh, per perimeter of the uh, rectangle. And with that, the possibilities became endless. I found uh, some space in one of the deserted buildings here, uh, where the RISD store is now, and I, for $30 a month I rented it and set up a studio up there. When uh, space in this building became available, I was invited to come here. By this time, I was a longtime member of the Providence Art Club. and So I've been here for, uh, in this building for 15 years, or it was just when I was losing my vision that uh, all of this transpired. I have what is called macular degeneration, and uh, I look through a, a jeweler's loop so I can identify what the colors are. And I can see shapes, and I can see values, and if I put the colors on the palette in the same situation each time, I know where the red is, I know where the yellow is. I wouldn't recommend it <laughs> to anyone, but, but it, it apparently is survivable. I found uh, less and less uh, that I needed to record what was there, and more and more realizing that the, the, the riddle of the uh, rectangle or the square was what solving that riddle was what, uh, what painting was about. That aspect of, of painting is what makes these things possible, because right? that's all they are. They're remembered uh, landscapes, they're not uh, acute observations of reality or translations of the, the reality into in some kind of photographic or realistic uh, uh, terms, but rather a, a, a recognition of the entire canvas and the shape relationships, the big against the little, the rough against the smooth, the cool against the warm, which is the, the language of painting. And what made uh, losing my sight uh, not that large a tragedy in the last analysis, 